Okay, so I'm Freddie Witherden and I'm from the Aeronautics Department at Imperial College London and today I'm going to be talking about our code, PyFAR, which I've entitled Heterogeneous Computing on Mixed Unstructured Grids Using Python. So being from the engineering department, we have a motivation and our contention is that modern day industrial CFD has relatively limited capabilities when it comes to solving unsteady problems. So what you can see up here is a slide I stole from Murray Cross at Airbus. And what I want you to focus on is that middle plot there. And what this basically shows is the area in which a modern day aircraft must be validated at. So along the x-axis, we have equivalent airspeed and along the y-axis, we have the load. Now, that red dot there basically corresponds to cruising over the Atlantic at around 38,000 feet. So you've got a load of 1G, and you're at cruise altitude. And this red dot represents the area where Airbus believes that modern-day industrial CFD is useful and applicable during the design process. However, this larger blue bounding box is the area in which the aircraft must be validated and certified to fly at. <laughs> Hence, there really is a need to expand the envelope in which CFD is useful into these so-called off-design conditions. So our objective is to advance the capabilities of industrial CFD beyond their current time average, predominantly steady state, so-called Reynolds average Navier Stokes into performing large eddy simulations and direct numerical simulations or DNS simulations. And this is what the earlier talk kind of was about. And our plan, being an engineering department, to do this is to improve both the numerics, so the underlying methods that we're using, but also to leverage Python and the capabilities of modern hardware platforms, including the mic, in order to deliver a product to industry that can solve real, complicated, unsteady flow problems on complicated geometries or in the vicinity of complicated geometries. So in the previous slide, I mentioned modern hardware. What do I mean by that? Well, on this plot here, we have the, in the red line, we have the peak floating point capabilities of a modern day Intel Xeon CPU from 1994 to 2014. And in the blue line, we have the peak memory bandwidth. And what we can see is that over the past 20 years, the arithmetic capabilities of CPU, so how many floating point operations we can do a second, has greatly outpaced the memory bandwidth, so how fast we can move data onto and off of the chip. And this is really important if you're going to design an HPC code because algorithms that were efficient 20 years ago probably aren't going to be efficient now just because the limiting factor has changed. Computation is now relatively cheap and what's expensive is moving data. Secondly, to throw another spanner into the works, we have accelerators. This plot here shows the percentage of flops contributed by accelerators, so Intel Xeon Phi's, NVIDIA GPUs and AMD GPUs in the top 500. And what we can see is that since around 2008, there's been a rapid increase in the total number of flops in the top 500 list coming from accelerators. Furthermore, if we just dial into the top 10, so the 10 fastest supercomputers, what we find is that two of them are based on the off of the Xeon Phi coprocessor, and two of them are based off of the NVIDIA te uh, Tesla GPUs. In other words, there's a wide mix. Furthermore, if we drill down just into these clusters themselves, we not only find that accelerators themselves are being adopted, but also that the clusters we're running on are becoming increasingly heterogeneous. So looking at the Stampede cluster at TAC, which ranks in at number seven on the top 500 list, we see that 2.2 petaflops of compute performance come from the Intel Xeon CPUs, uh, whereas 7.4 petaflops of compute performance come from the coprocessors. Hence, if your code can only work, run well on a CPU, you're throwing away a lot of performance. And similarly, if your code can only really work well on the coprocessor, you're also chucking away a lot of performance. Now, you may be, think you may be thinking that this is just, you know, on the high end, these are the top 500 systems. I run most of my stuff on a laptop. Why does this matter? Well, this heterogeneity isn't just coming in at the high end, it's also on your desktop. So what I've got here is a die shot from a recent Intel Broadwell CPU, and up the top you can see your four processing cores, but all that space towards the right of the 
plot is dedicated towards the GPU, which you can access and program and harness. In other words, if your code can only run on the CPU cores, even if it's fully multi-threaded and fully vectorized, you're still chucking away a lot of the capabilities that exist on the chip itself, even if you're just running on a desktop. Or, in other words, heterogeneity really is ubiquitous at both the high end and the low end. But there's a problem, and that's called performance portability. If you want to run on these various coprocessors and accelerators, there are various different standards and programming languages that you have available to you. You want to run an Intel Xeon Phi or on a regular Intel CPU, then the best option is OpenMP. If you want to target an AMD GPU, then their preferred language is OpenCL. And if you want to run on an, an NVIDIA GPU, then their recommended preferred language is CUDA. Which means at some level, if you want to be able to target all of these platforms, you're potentially faced with the daunting task of having to write your core algorithm three times, which isn't sustainable, it's hard to debug, and it's hard enough convincing an engineer to write any code whatsoever. To convince them to learn three separate parallel programming languages and to debug and maintain all these codes, it's just a non-starter. So we've thought about this in our group, and how can we can kind of work around this? And we feel that a good way of doing this is through leveraging the power of Python and the kind of level of abstraction it provides in order to make it easier to target these kind of platforms. So our code is called PyFR, and it u it's written in Python, and it uses these so-called flux reconstruction algorithms to solve the compressible Navier-Stokes equations on mixed unstructured grids. So the previous talk we saw used was also solving Navier-Stokes equations, but that was using a spectral method in kind of a box. What we're interested in, in kind of the engineering sense, is on complex geometry, things like landing gears, aerofoils, and the such, which is significantly more complicated. And furthermore, we don't want to solve these unsteady Navier-Stokes equations. We want to solve them performance portably on a range of platforms. So how do we go about doing this? Well, we said, OK, let's have an outer layer in Python that handles the setup the I.O. and the distributed memory parallelism. So that's reading in the config file. It's opening up the mesh. It's converting the mesh. It's setting up the MPI communication and basically managing the outer for loop, saying what kernels need to be invoked. This is where Python really does pay dividend because it's just so much easier than, say, C or C++, thanks to its garbage collection and its rich range, uh, variety of modules such as NumPy and MPI for Pi that really remove a huge chunk of the boilerplate code which litters your traditional C or C++ uh, application. Then we, of course, if we want to run on a variety of platforms and we want to do so performance portably, we need to generate the hardware-specific kernels. Now, one of the nice things about the flux reconstruction approach and one of the reasons it works so well on modern hardware platforms is that the operations can kind of be split down into matrix multiplications and pointwise nonlinear kernels. So pointwise nonlinear kernels may be evaluating the flux or performing a so-called Riemann solve inside the domain. Now, matrix multipliers are nice because we can just call gem from vendor blast. Every single para uh, parallel programming coprocessor accelerator, they all come with high performance blast libraries, be it kublas, clblast, mkl, that have an optimized gem routine. So all we're really left with is how do we generate these platform-specific pointwise nonlinear kernels? And the approach we've taken is through templating. So we've taken the Mako templating language, which is primarily intended for uh, you know, rendering web pages, and instead said, can we use this to generate source code? With the idea being that you write your kernel once in a very simple, very restricted, domain-specific language, this is then passed through the Mako templating engine, which will then generate platform-specific kernels for the various bits of hardware we want to support. So OpenCL, CUDA, and OpenMP annotated C. Once we have these kernels, this kind of completes the loop, and they can be called by our Python outer for loop. The idea being that no heavy computation is actually ever done in Python. It's just managing the setup phase, generating the code, and managing the distributed memory parallelism where all the actual compute is either offloaded to vendor libraries or to native kernels. So to give you an example of what one of these kind of Mako templated kernels looks like, I've just put one up here. So the first thing you notice is it looks like a really, uh, yes. Is that another question? Oh. 
So what you can see up here is this kind of PyFAR kernel thing, and that looks a bit like a really bad HTML tag. But inside the body of that tag, you can see some Python code, and right in the middle, you can see something that looks a bit like C code. And the idea being that the definition of this PyFR kernel tag changes depending on if you want to generate OpenCL, CUDA, or OpenMP. We run it through a templating engine, and it generates the function prototype. So the core tenets of PyFR are very much around, firstly, let's exploit the rich Python ecosystem. And this really is what makes the whole thing possible. So we need to exchange data between nodes. We can take MPI for Py, which wraps MPI. We need to allocate device on NVIDIA GPU, PyCUDA. We want to access the mic and start running kernels on there, PyMic. High performance parallel I.O., 85 Pi. There are a fantastic set of libraries that are already written, debugged, with very nice interfaces that basically allow us to very rapidly bootstrap PyFar on various platforms and to do so manageably and maintainably. The other core tenant is that all computation should be offloaded. And as a result of this, the overhead in PyFar from the interpreter is less than 1% of the runtime. So to give you some results from PyFar, we have a nice benchmark flow problem, which is flow over a cylinder at Reynolds number 3900, Mach 0.2. This is a nice test case, which shows experimental data and isn't too computationally kind of intensive. So we've taken this problem and we've looked at the single node performance of PyFAR on three different platforms. So we have an AMD W9100 GPU, which we target using OpenCL, an NVIDIA K40, and a 12-core Ivy Bridge CPU, which we target using CopenMP. And we've run PyFAR at various polynomial orders. So PyFAR is what's known as a high order code in the sense of the order of accuracy. So how does the error change as you refine your grid? Can be varied dynamically. And what we see here is, on the right, the sustained performance of PyFAR in gigaflops per second. The key thing to kind of take away here is that by the time you're using fourth-order polynomials on both the Intel CPU and the NVIDIA K40, we're pushing above 50% of peak. Now, being a parallel code, we can take those results, we can decompose our domain into three different chunks, and we can run all three at once. In other words, we can run on the NVIDIA GPU, the AMD GPU and the Intel CPU, all in parallel. And we can look at the sustained gigaflops here. So what we achieve in PyFAR is the blue bar. And what we kind of miss out because we don't strong scale perfectly and because of overheads is the red bar. In other words, we're running heterogeneously across all of these platforms. So this is one simulation that's been decomposed across all three platforms at the same time. Finally, I'd just like to finish up with some weak scaling results on PizDaint at CSCS. So this is an NVIDIA K20X cluster. And what you can see here is we took a NACA 21 aerofoil. We weak scaled it up to 2,000 NVIDIA GPUs, where we managed to obtain 1.3 petaflops uh, per second of sustained performance, which is approximately 50% of peak, with a total of 32 billion degrees of freedom. So this really is Python at petascale. And I don't know if we have any time for... Uh, well, you can just at least... Uh, you can so time for questions instead. It's more useful. Any questions? Yes? So Mako is powerful enough to generate the, the like the CUDA code and the other code out of out of one file? So you, you yep, so one file that the engineer writes once in basically scalar code and then our templating language will generate the low level kernels for the various platforms. So kernels are only ever written once and then they automatically run on kind of all of the platforms that we support. So any yes so last question. Uh, hi. Is is the layer that you wrote to abstract the heterogeneity of the uh, computing hardware that runs it sort of independent of the uh, partial differential equations that you run? As in, could someone else use that to do fast computing without, that's not necessarily PDEs? So the language is deliberately designed to be very restrictive. It just does the kind of point-wise operations that we need. So you can think about it as, if you could do it with NumPy ufunks, you could do it with our domain specific language. But anything beyond that requires coupling or looking at adjacent values is kind of beyond the scope. Okay, so 
Thank you.